Well, welcome everyone to this month's Wednesday 101 webinar. I'm Leslie Scott and I'm with Reuseful. And today's uh, topic, this month's topic is green burial and not a topic that everyone likes to think about, but it is an inevitability for all of us. And so I really appreciate Stephanie being here to uh, lead us through what uh, the options are and really help us understand more about what green burial really is. Um, there's a lot of options out there and she's gonna go through those and, and educate us, which is going to be great. So um, I wanted to take just a minute to talk about uh, Reuseful and I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, to if anybody's local, I know we have some local folks on the call, um, but uh, we do have an event on Saturday uh, presented by ARP. And uh, so if you are local to Kansas City, we would love to have you come out, bring your still good stuff, uh, your documents to shred, your tires to recycle, and also your, your e-waste um, to uh, recycle or refurbish. And uh, that will be, um, on Saturday from nine to one at South Broadland Presbyterian Church. And uh, I will drop the, um, the link to the information in the chat and uh, that way you have that. So we are a nonprofit that helps people um, just live more sustainably by uh, thinking about how to uh, reduce or reuse um, their consumption and then um, also how to, to get those still good items into the hands of nonprofit organizations that can put it to good use. So I will drop that in the chat. And um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to Stephanie. Okay, thank you so much for having me. It'll take me a minute now to share my screen. Uh... Let me share this and get the presentation mode. Okay, can you guys see the full um, the full presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so as Leslie said, my name is Stephanie Drazen. And I currently sit on the board of directors and serve as secretary for the Green Burial Council. And I have spent my career working in the environmental field, but only recently became aware of green burial um, actually during the pandemic. So when we think of environmentalism and sustainability, death care might not be the first thing that comes to mind. Um, we might think about conserving energy or conserving water, maybe waste, um, you know, reuse, recycle, um, being less wasteful in general. However, all of this applies to green burial as well. So in this talk, I'm going to go over some of the basics of green burial, what it is, why it's important, and how you could pursue a green burial option for yourself or your loved ones. During the talk, I'm going to go over some conventional burial practices and some of the harm they can cause to the environment. And then I'll go over uh, sustainable burial practices in general before taking a deep dive into green burial specifically and the work we do at the Green Burial Council. And then at the end of the talk, there should be plenty of time for questions and answers. So during the presentation, you can either drop questions you may have in the chat or Leslie, I don't know if you usually just kind of open the floor for questions at the end. Okay, um, I see you nodding and we can go over as many as time allows then at the end. So without further ado, let's talk a little about conventional burial practices. What we now consider conventional burial practices usually consist of embalming of the decedent, followed by burial in a casket and the use of concrete grave liners or vaults. While other cultures have been embalming bodies for centuries, embalming didn't become standard practice in the United States until roughly 150 years ago. 
Before then, what we now think of as green burial was actually the norm. Um, during the Civil War, many soldiers died on battlefields far away from their homes, but their families wanted to give them a proper burial. And the only way to transport them long distances without the bodies beginning to decompose was by embalming them. So that's what was done. Then when Abraham Lincoln was embalmed upon his death, the practice really took root and kind of became popular in America. Grave liners and vaults also became popular during the rise of lawn style cemeteries as they make it easier to maintain a uniform appearance and don't require as much effort to backfill the soil as a body decomposes and the ground settles. And the next slide, I kind of show what those are and go into a little more detail. Um, additionally, concrete vaults and grave liners helped actually deter grave robbers during the late 19th and earliest centuries when grave robbing was more common. Um, one caveat I do want to point out, and I think I, I mentioned, many communities have continued to practice green burial throughout the last 150 years, particularly the Jewish and Muslim communities. So this isn't like a new concept by any means. So as you may or may not know, I did not know this before I started getting involved in, in green burial. Um, conventional burial practices are very resource intensive. So embalming itself adds chemicals into the body to help preserve it. However, nothing ultimately lasts forever. And when the body and casket do break down, those preservatives can leach into surrounding groundwater. And then additionally, and perhaps even more egregious, is the use of these concrete grave liners or vaults. These are meant to protect a grave from collapsing and make it easier for lawn style cemeteries to maintain that uniform appearance that we're kind of used to seeing here in America. However, concrete itself is actually really resource intensive. It requires large energy inputs to create and releases carbon dioxide when it's mixed, giving it a large carbon footprint. In fact, it's estimated that roughly four to 8% of all carbon emissions in the US come from concrete. This is in addition to the carbon footprint associated with the casket itself, which can be better or worse depending on where the material is sourced from and what materials are used. Lastly, I want to point out that I did attempt to find some life cycle data to compare these different burial practices, but most of the available data was very anecdotal. It's not something that's been studied very much. Um, and this is something that the Science and Research Advisory Panel with the Green Burial Council is working on, um, but it's also something that's needed to help further legitimize the field of green burial. Okay, so hopefully that helped give a little bit of an overview of some of the environmental concerns surrounding conventional burial practices and why you might want to consider a more sustainable alternative. So now we're gonna go over some of the sustainable burial practices that are available to us in the United States. On the left here, we have a list of some of the sustainable practices that are available in the US. But before I go into detail on those, I did want to point out a handful of popular, albeit maybe theoretical, sustainable burial practices that you may have seen in the news. Um, these come up and we get questions about them, but they aren't actual options for us right now. So promession or cryogenic freezing. Um, has been proposed as an option, but it's it's not actually supported as physically possible by scientists right now. The Swedish company Promessa that was attempting this was liquidated in 2015 after failing to prove viability. Um, a little bit more commonly seen in the news is this mushroom suit <laughs> pictured here, which is a burial garment inoculated with mycelium or mushroom spores intended to neutralize toxins in the body, potentially speeding up the natural process of decomposition and enhancing the available nutrient output. However, there were concerns in the conservation community regarding the necessity, viability, and scientific support of this, and a failed field study resulted in the suit going out of production. So that's not, unfortunately, not an option right now either. 
And then finally, Capsula Mundi. This is that picture we've all seen on the internet of a person kind of in a fetal position um, in an egg-shaped sack under a tree. Um, that one comes up a lot. We get a lot of questions about that. However, that egg-shaped sack was actually created as an urn for cremated remains, not as a full body um, burial option. Um, it is made of biodegradable plastic and is meant to be interred in the ground and then have a tree of your choosing planted over it. However, given what we know about the biodegradability and nutrient harvest capacity of cremated remains, the chances that a tree would grow to maturity over cremated remains is unlikely. And while the urn is available on their website, there's no product available for full body burial at this time. So it's an option for cremated remains, but not for full body burial. Okay, now let's get into some of these actual sustainable burial practices. These are roughly in order from least to most sustainable. The first of which I have is memorial reefs. And in the case of memorial reefs, a decedent is cremated in a conventional crematory. And this is a good place to mention that some people consider cremation a greener alternative than conventional burial. When it came on the scene, that's kind of how it was presented. However, I come originally from the energy sector and the amount of natural gas needed to operate a crematory kind of rules that out as a sustainable practice, in my opinion. Um, additionally, mercury is emitted when a person with certain dental fillings is cremated, along with other metals um, and filtration devices that can fully mitigate mercury pollution haven't been invented yet. Furthermore, because of the density and non-biodegradable content of cremated remains, some green burial cemeteries actually don't even allow scattering of cremated remains. They consist of calcium phosphate and sodium, which can smother foliage if they're scattered over the tops of plants. And then if you bury cremated remains, they can create what is essentially a nutrient deficit salt lick that has no environmental benefits and can cause girdling of trees and destruction of microbial communities um, because all of those nutrients, all that carbon is burned off in the process of cremation. Above ground, this can produce phosphorus runoff and create algal blooms and waterways, killing fish and plants. So while cremation is not an environmentally positive option, there are several things that can be done to attempt to offset the carbon footprint of cremation, such as recycling medical parts or making a contribution to a carbon fund or even supporting ocean reef regro regrowth such as the case with memorial reefs. So I know cremation is popular, particularly with a lot of the older generation. Um, so if that's something that maybe your loved ones have already decided on, this is something that can be done to kind of maybe offset some of those um, decisions. Once a decedent is cremated, their remains are mixed in this case, the case of memorial reefs, um, the remains are mixed into a nutrient-rich concrete slurry that kind of adds back some of those nutrients that are burned off in the cremation process and then molded into a reef ball. These are then cast into the sea and can contribute to the artificial development and restoration of coral reefs along seaboards that have been damaged. So while cremation itself is not the most sustainable burial practice, supporting the development and restoration of coral reefs is. And this option is also particularly popular for cremated remains of pets, actually. Um, it's, it's probably even more so popular for pets than it is for, for humans. Secondly, we have burial at sea. This is pretty rare, <laughs> um, but this consists of scattering cremated remains into the ocean or even consigning an entire corpse into the ocean. As you might imagine, this is heavily regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency and requires a number of permits and notifications. Um, I've already gone over some of the issues with cremation, so I won't repeat that here. 
Uh, but for burial at sea, cremated remains must be scattered at least three miles offshore. And then full bodies must be consigned at least three miles offshore and at least 600 feet deep. Different states and localities have their own rules and regulations surrounding burial at sea. So, for example, off the coast of Massachusetts might be different than off the coast of California. Once a decedent is cremated, there really isn't any sustainable burial practice associated with scattering the remains at sea. But if you're consigning an entire corpse, so long as the decedent is wrapped in something readily biodegradable, like a shroud or pine box, and is accessible to animals living on the ocean floor, this can be a source of nutrients to surrounding wildlife as it decomposes, making it a sustainable burial practice. And like I said, this is pretty rare um, and is mostly used for like Navy personnel um, in the military, um, particularly like high up Navy personnel. Thirdly, we have funeral pyres, or rather pyre, as there's only one location in the United States that allows for open air cremation, and that is Crestone in Sagua County, Colorado, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, I know I've looked it up in the past. Um, additionally, you must be a resident of that county in order to qualify. However, I've heard of people literally moving there shortly before dying so that they could be buried in this manner. This burial practice consists of packing a half cord of wood beneath a pyre and placing the decedent covered only by a linen shroud on top. The decedent is then covered by strong smelling plants, usually juniper and cedar, to help dampen the smell as the body burns. And while this might be slightly more sustainable than traditional cremation due to the use of wood rather than natural gas, it still releases a lot of carbon into the air and is pretty resource intensive. However, funeral pyres have been used for centuries and many wish to be buried this way as a tribute to their ancestors. So it's particularly popular with the Native American population. Okay, now we're getting into some more common practices that are, are probably more in use currently. Um, we have natural organic reduction, otherwise known as human composting <laughs> or terramation. Long story short, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is a sped up decomposition that transforms human remains into a nutrient rich soil similar to compost. Here, the decedent is placed in a vessel and covered with organic matter such as wood chips, alfalfa, and straw. The vessel is then lightly heated for about two months while microbes break down the body. And once the process is done, you're left with roughly a cubic yard of soil that the family can have or can be used to restore forests and brownfield sites. All things considered, the amount of energy required is relatively low and the organic matter needed is fast growing and readily renewable, making this a sustainable burial practice. Currently, it is only legal in Washington, Colorado, Vermont, Oregon, California, New York, and Nevada, but bills have been introduced in an additional 12 states this year alone. Moving on, we have alkaline hydrolysis, also referred to as aquamation, resumation, or water cremation. In this process, the decedent is placed into a pressurized vessel to which a mixture of water and potassium hydroxide is added. The vessel is then heated under high pressure to rapidly dissolve the body in this highly alkaline, highly basic water. After roughly four to 16 hours, depending on the heat and pressure, as well as the size of the decedent, you are left with bones and a nutrient rich water. The bones are usually crushed and returned to the family, similar to cremated remains, and the water can then be disposed of or even used as a fertilizer since it's so nutrient dense. As long as you have unlimited access to water, which admittedly is not the case for everyone everywhere, um, the only real resource input again is energy. 
And if a renewable source of energy is used to heat the vessel, this process can be very sustainable. It is currently legal in 21 states and bills have been introduced to legalize it in almost every other state this year. Finally, we have home funerals. This is less of a burial practice and more of a funeral practice, but I wanted to mention it. In all but seven states, you are not required to make use of a funeral director. For many years before the modern funeral industry sprung up, people prepared their loved ones for burial at home. And again, many cultures and communities have continued to do this throughout the popularization of commercial funeral homes. This can consist of bringing a decedent home from a nursing home or hospital, washing and dressing them, laying them out for vigil, holding a memorial service, and transporting them to their final resting place. In conjunction with one of the sustainable burial practices I've mentioned, this can be a very meaningful death practice for the family of a deceased loved one. However, before deciding if this is right for you, we highly suggest reaching out to the National Home Funeral Alliance and checking to make sure you understand all of the associated funeral laws and regulations in your state. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into a little more detail on green burial specifically. What exactly is green burial? So I have green in quotations because it often gets used as a blanket term across all environmental fields to signal something is environmentally friendly. For example, all of the sustainable burial practices we just covered could be considered green burial options. However, the Green Burial Council defines green burial as a way of caring for our dead that furthers one or more environmental aims, such as conservation of natural resources, reduction of carbon emissions, preservation and or restoration of habitat, and protection of worker health. While that definition could apply to many different disposition methods, the Green Burial Council uses the term to refer to burial of a decedent directly into the earth using only readily biodegradable covers, such as a linen shroud or a pine box. This allows the microbes in the soil to slowly break down the body over time and make use of all the nutrients contained within. This form of green burial has been practiced by humans across the world for millennia, and this is the burial practice we at the B Green Burial Council advocate for. Additionally, the Green Burial Council has laid out the following characteristics for green burial and green burial cemeteries. Green burial forgoes toxic embalming, does away with vaults and grave liners, specifically chooses biodegradable containers such as caskets, linens, shrouds, and urns, discontinues the use of herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, and encourages sustainable management practices. Additionally, green burial may use GPS units or non-native stone markers to mark grave sites. However, some cemeteries may just use coordinates or native plants. Lastly, green burial may also support land conservation efforts, and I will go into more detail on that. So with that definition in mind, I'm going to introduce you to the Green Burial Council and some of the work we do to advocate for green burial. The Green Burial Council was founded in 2005 by Joe Sihi to establish standards within the growing green burial movement. Similar to a LEED building or an Energy Star appliance, the Green Burial Council provides certification for cemeteries, funeral homes, and products that offer green burial. So we're affecting change by providing realistic, verifiable, standard-based rating systems so the public has a reliable measure when making environmentally sensitive and responsible funeral choices. Unfortunately, this is becoming increasingly important given the pervasiveness of greenwashing, which is the marketing of sustainable or green practices without the actions to back them up. And this happens you know, across the board, but this is happening in the funeral industry when green package offerings include items such as embalming fluid that contain toxic chemicals or caskets from manufacturers whose environmental claims aren't backed up by safety data sheets or life cycle analyses and cemeteries claiming to offer green burial that either won't accept shrouds or maybe even require the use of burial vaults. 
So by using a cemetery, funeral home, or product that has been certified by the Green Burial Council, consumers can be reassured that the organization has gone through a rigorous approval process and meets the Green Burial standards laid out by the Green Burial Council. So that might cause you to wonder what are those standards and what's included in them. Like I said, the Green Burial Council, we certify cemeteries, funeral homes, and products. So firstly, I'm gonna go over the type of cemeteries we certify, which are hybrid, natural, and conservation. Each of these has a long list of requirements they must meet, but for brevity's sake, I'm just gonna go over like super high level basics. Um, if you're interested in knowing more about each of the requirements listed in our standard, they are publicly available on our website. So cemeteries. First, we have hybrid cemeteries. Hybrid cemeteries offer both conventional and green burial options. And this is usually a conventional cemetery that offers the essential aspects of green burial either throughout the cemetery or in a designated section. Hybrid cemeteries don't require vaults and must allow for any kind of eco-friendly biodegradable burial container, such as a shroud or a soft wood casket. Secondly, we certify natural burial grounds. These are cemeteries dedicated in full to green burial practices and protocols that conserve energy and minimize waste. They do not allow the use of toxic chemicals, grave liners, vaults, markers made of non-native non stone, or burial containers not made from plant-derived materials. Natural burial grounds also go a step beyond and perform an ecological impact assessment that informs where they bury decedents without disturbing the natural habitat. Finally, we have kind of like our gold star cemeteries. These are the conservation burial grounds. These cemeteries are established in partnership with a conservation organization and include a conservation management plan that upholds best practices and provides perpetual protection of the land according to a legally binding conservation easement or deed restriction. They also make a commitment to conserve or restore a minimum of five acres of natural habitat. So I, I know this is a bit a lot, but in a nutshell, that is what is included in the Green Burial Council Cemetery Standards. And just a little snapshot from our website, a list of all of the Green Burial Council certified cemeteries is available on our website by state. And then we also have a map that you can search and you can find um, all of the cemeteries that we certify. Secondly, we have our funeral home certification. So in order to be certified, a funeral home must define in their general price list and publish on their website, their green burial offerings. These must include the sanitation and temporary preservation of a decedent using only non-toxic biodegradable chemicals or simply basic cooling methods and the option of a private visitation without chemical embalming. They must also carry at least three Green Burial Council certified burial containers, accommodate families choosing to conduct home vigils prior to viewing on site without embalming, and offer sanitation and temporary preservation of a decedent using only non-invasive techniques and materials. And again, um, I'll go over exactly how to find this information but all of the Green Burial Council certified funeral homes can also be found on our website listed by state. Finally, we have our product certification. This covers things such as caskets, urns, and shrouds. To be eligible for certification, a product must meet a number of rigorous criteria. All certified caskets, urns, and shrouds must be constructed from plant-derived, recycled plant derived, natural, animal, or unfired earthen materials, including the shell, liner, and adornments. These materials must be reclaimed, recycled, or renewable, biodegradable under burial conditions, and harvested in an environmentally sustainable manner as certified by a third party trust provider recognized by the Green Burial Council. All fasteners and handles, other than those made from brass or chrome, 
are excluded from this requirement. However, a product may not be approved if such hardware is deemed to be excessive or ineffectively used. Additionally, all finishes, adhesives, and dyes cannot release toxic byproducts within their manufacturing facility or through the expected process of breakdown and or disposal. They also cannot contain plastics, acrylics, or similar synthetic materials. Finally, greenhouse gas emissions produced by transportation of any material to the manufacturing location and transportation of the final product to the consumer must be offset through a recognized program. And again, a list of all certified products are available on our website. So if you or a loved one are interested in green burial, the first place to go, I'd suggest, is our website. Um, you can select the Find GBC Providers drop down uh, from the header and choose if you want to search for cemeteries, funeral homes, or product providers. You're also able to search using the interactive map where you can zoom in on your location. Many cemeteries and funeral homes offer what's called pre-planning, where you can designate the type of burial you would like and create a plan with the funeral provider. However, um, that is not necessary in order to have a green burial. You can simply communicate your desire for a green burial with your loved ones. Another option is to fill out an advanced directive, which is a document that allows you to spell out how you want your loved ones to handle your burial after you pass away and each state kind of has their own legal form for that. Additionally, if you cannot find a certified cemetery or funeral home near you, we recommend reaching out to your local cemetery or funeral home to see if they offer green burial options. Many places may offer these services and just aren't certified with us or may even be willing to work with you to provide green burial services. For example, my local cemetery in like pretty small town, Wisconsin, recently opened a green burial section of their cemetery, so they would be considered a hybrid. Um, so the movement is definitely growing, and it's always worth asking. And if you find a provider offering these services, like you send them our way for certification, but um, definitely not necessary. Um, that's just one way to kind of check and see if they're on our website. So before I wrap up, I wanted to point out some of the Green Burial Council's upcoming offerings. We put out a bi-monthly newsletter that includes updates from our board of directors, information on upcoming events, newly certified cemeteries, funeral homes, and products, as well as lots of other good stuff. You can sign up at our website to receive those. We also offer two paid courses through our partner, Redesigning the End, on green funeral service and green burial cemetery operation. And we also do quarterly public webinars on all different topics related to green burial. The next one will be held in May, so keep an eye out for information on that. We occasionally post green burial advocacy and volunteer opportunities on our social media accounts, which is at Green Burial Council on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So make sure to follow us there. Um, we are also currently looking for volunteers with grant writing experience. So if you're interested, you can fill out the volunteer interest form on our website. And finally, for more information on everything covered today, um, our website is massive and has tons of information, um, but you can also reach out to me. Here's my email. Um, feel free to reach out with any questions if I don't get a chance to answer yours. But with that, I can stop sharing maybe and I guess open it up for some questions. I, I know that was a lot. Well, we do have questions in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna start from, from the most recent one because I think um, this is a good general question. So Janine asks, what prevents a person from having a natural burial or burial no casket while involving, et cetera, on their own property. So if you maybe have a farm or something like that, is that possible? It is possible, but I will say it is different by different like states and localities. So unfortunately, I don't know each individual one. Um, so I would say you kind of, it's, it's 
a pain in the butt, frankly, but I would say you have to kind of do your research and look into um, your state, even maybe down to your county um, and see kind of what's allowed. Um, if you're if you're in a rural environment, I would say most places that I've seen, it's usually allowed. You might have to do some paperwork with the county, um, but um, to to determine if you're kind of like over a watershed or something like that. Um, but in most cases like that, it's, it's probably allowed. Um, but it, yeah, it, it does depend and it is different in kind of every, every situation. The, the, in general, the, the funeral industry is pretty state by state. Um, and even sometimes, you know, county by county, locality by locality. So um, unfortunately, yeah, you kind of have to do your research. So where would one start to ask that question, do you think? Um, oh. I do think the National Home Funeral Alliance, they have um, individual like contacts for every state okay. that they can put you in contact with. Um, who might like they would you know specialize in their state that could point you to like hey I'm this assigned to this state or whatever um, and they could connect you there so that's a good like organization to start with the National Home Funeral Alliance but then also like um, every like state or county is going to have like a board of funeral directors or something like that that you could reach out to and kind of ask questions, um, even like your your city council person or something like that. Like use your state and city representatives. That's it's their job to find that information for you. Okay, okay. great. Um, Janine also asks, um, and Janine, feel free to come off mute um, and um, and ask this question just to make sure that we understand um, what information you're you're looking for around the residency requirements um what are the residency for states with no green yeah it's area? just it's kind of like the medical assistance in dying if you don't live in a state where it's um available like i think it's oregon and maybe new hampshire or vermont or something you can go to that state but you don't have to be a resident and so is it the same for burial meaning if you don't live there you know, I live in Massachusetts. Can I be buried in Joshua Tree? If oh. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, do you have to be a resident of the state? Um, and actually, as you were talking, I was kind of looking online at the greenburialma.org. And there are some specific, um, there are some specific cemeteries and right, they list exactly whether they will allow, you have to be a resident of the actual town at least out here in Boston. So okay. I wasn't sure if it was just a, doesn't sound like it's a national thing. It sounds like it's a municipal thing. I was gonna say, I haven't heard of any places that have like restrictions on green burial as far as like that not being an option everywhere. Certain cemeteries might not have it and might not allow it, but like legally speaking, it's not um like banned by any means because right right because I think what it is is that um like what I'm seeing here is it'll list like the count it'll list the town the county and then the cemetery and when you click on it it actually has a drop down that says you know like for instance I live near Lexington and Concord mm -hmm. and so when you drop down it says Lexington it's only open to residents of Lexington or people who have lived there before Okay. So it sounds like even at that really tight municipal level, um, there are some restrictions. So it kind of answered my question while you were. No, so. <laughs> th that's okay. And it, 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 I'm sorry, I guess I, 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 I hate not being able to answer questions because it's like, oh, it's so specific. Like I could tell you the ones for like Racine, Wisconsin, but I don't, but I can't for Boston, unfortunately, because they are like weirdly specific occasionally. Um, but I do know about like the, the terramation, for example, um, that they, um, is the, is the, like the human composting, which I know sounds kind of crude. And so we've been going with the, the terramation, um, 
wording um the states that have that legal right now um people are being like transferred there because they want that and i think there's like two states i want to say it's like kansas and alabama that don't allow a body to leave the state for a burial purpose that isn't allowed within the state so like if you're in kansas and alabama or something like that you can't technically a lot of sense do yeah. it but like other <laughs> right. states you could be sent you could be shipped I don't want to say you shipped, but like transported to Oregon and yeah. have that done. If and people are like people are really invested in that that one in particular for whatever reason is really like fire right now. People are into it. Um, so uh, we do have a, a couple questions. I think Alyssa, your question um, about the cost was around uh, terramation as well, yeah. right? Correct. Yeah. And then um, Janine is wondering what the heat source is for terramation. I can share a couple links to the two organizations that I know that are doing it. Both of them are kind of based out in that Pacific Northwest because they were the first to kind of do it. Um, the two organizations that I know of are called Recompose um, is one of them. And then... Um, I think returning home is the other one. I will drop them in the chat because I'm I'm not actually super sure about the cost. I and I don't want to give you I don't want to give oh pricing. Okay. On Recompose's website. Um, okay, it says our seven thousand dollar price includes the following services. Empathetic care, transportation within our service area, sheltering, death certificate filing, transportation, transformation. So, so roughly seven thousand um, is recomposes, um, which compared to green burial is more more expensive compared to conventional burial. Depending on how much you want to spend on a casket and all the fancy accoutrements, like that's actually not that. Um, it's, it's, you know, fairly competitive pricing. Um, and then return, I think it's return home is the other one um, that I've seen present before. And I'll drop those two in the chat just because, yeah, those are the two that come up the most. Um, We've covered um, most of the questions except for um, the first one Janine had when you were talking about um, the coral reef um, option and she was wondering how cremated remains um, differ from the, you know, just bones decomposing um, in the ocean. Um, so my understanding, cremated remains, because any like nutrients oh gosh I'm gonna yeah, you were like talking about the calcium piece of it and yeah so the question was you know um in cremated remains basically it's the it's I understand that they have been trans well they've been changed by heat mm -hmm. and I guess my question you were you were saying a lot of things about you know like planting it under trees and the impact and that sort of thing and I guess my question was is how is that different than just the natural decomposition of bones and the calcium within them. And, and how, how, why would cremated remains have more of a negative environmental impact than just the bones in their natural state? I'm, I'm not a hundred percent expert on this, but I, what I guess my thought process is any and all of the organic content is going to be burned off during that cremation process and you're left with like ash like from like a fire it's, it's just ash there's nothing that right. can and be and that's what I was thinking it's really just kind of like ash which is yeah just, you know basically just I mean exists in nature after fires all the time right but whatever like inorganic content is there that can't be utilized anymore sure um and whereas like the 
there is going to be some of that, obviously, I guess, whatever a small amount of it is in bone, but I, I would assume it's the, the ability to kind of like break that down and use it. There's just more that, that isn't burnt off into the atmosphere or whatever it's usable by the microbes and sea life and whatnot that's on the sea floor by like a full body does sure that it sense? wasn't actually about the uh sea it was just about oh it's between cremation and uh, natural decomposition of bones i'm sorry i don't have a better answer to that i can i can do some research and send it to you if you want because it's a good question um yeah i think also because i think uh like we did a bio urn uh, for our son and then we planted a tree on top of it and the tree seems to be doing well okay but my concern is that um you know based on what you said it sort of made me be a little concerned about the environmental impact you know we did a little garden and there's a whole bunch of stuff around it now but uh the environmental impact of uh the cremated remains wasn't anything that we thought about beforehand so mm -hmm. That's what it just kind of piqued my curiosity. Did you drop an email in the chat or something where I can contact you with more information? Sure, I can do that. Yeah, because I know I would be happy to look into it. It's a good question. I know I feel I guess I feel like I understand in theory, but I don't understand enough to be able to like uh add more to the conversation than what I've already already shared but there are more of us um on the council that are like in the field basically than I am I am I kind of like I said I come from more of the energy sector so this is newer to me and why I give the intro talk and not the detail the no 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 the... it's perfect you did a great job <laughs> oh thank you um I know there was the what what is the heat source in the terramation um discussion too and I think that that's dependent by like the the companies that recompose versus um return home and stuff it could it could be totally dependent it is like right. elect like electric heat plugged in okay because I was gonna say yeah. is it a is it a uh is it a, an, a is it a resource like a renewable resource or is it actually the same kinds of um, actually just over a longer period of time? I think you said it's like two months. Yeah. So no, they I know they like it's held at like 165 or something in order for it to be a faster process, frankly, than sure. just like burying your body in the ground. Yeah, it I mean that's what we hotter. do with our compost pile. Yeah, right? we exactly. need to add heat to our compost pile to make it to make it everything degrade faster and microbes love heat. So um, yes. it, makes, it makes sense. So they are lightly heating the vessels. I just don't know what individual source they're using. They're in the Pacific Northwest. So I would hope they have access to renewable energy, but I don't know what exactly each facility is individually using. Um, I thought I saw one other like question. Um, yeah, it was mine. It was just about like, why do you think so many, why do you think people are so not into it? Like, what, what do you think? What, why, why do you think there's so much resistance when it seems to be so much better for the environment, other than just like, not the cultural, you know, for the people who want it? Meaning, so I'm not trying to force people who don't want it to do it. I'm just saying that, um, why do you think places that could have it are resistant to it? Um, I think there are a couple things. I think there's similar to other things in a capitalist society. There's an established funeral industry that sells yeah. caskets and sells, right. you know, right. so there's that component. Right. Um, I also think that there is a concern with like, you know, groundwater and like um burying a body directly into the soil does it is there a chance that it's going to yeah affect particularly water comes up the most basically um 
and there isn't a ton of good data on it right now because it kind of just hasn't it's one of those weird things that like hasn't been studied because it hasn't really been an issue um it just hasn't come up a lot um right. and now it is it's it's kind of hitting the news frankly there's been a couple recently um Minnesota there was a cemetery that a, a green burial cemetery that didn't really get buy-in from the community beforehand um that kind of just bought up some land and was like we're gonna put a cemetery here and cemeteries in general whether sure. it's a green cemetery or not community communities are a little bit like I don't want a cemetery in my backyard yeah. um and so the state of Minnesota actually put a two-year moratorium on all green burial cemeteries while they um, conduct like a study on the safety of them. It's and so weird. Yeah. It, Just because I mean, from a Native American perspective, I mean, that's mm -hmm. really all there was. And so, and yeah, the, the I know the Jewish War, community is right, like exactly up, like up in arms would, about it too. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, even just a uh, pine box, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is so much, but, but you're exactly right. I think that the, that the funeral home even if they offer green burial, you can't tell me that you want to do it in a like $5,000 casket. So, mm -hmm. right. I think there's that. I think there's just like change is hard. Um, and I do, I do think there's, there's something to be said about, like you said, I guess, culturally, like the, when I have researched, like the concept of like vaults, those, like the, the concrete vault that you don't even see when you go to like bury a loved one it's already there the soil's already packed around it and you just see this the casket lowered in and you don't even know it's there but there's this like comfort of thinking that your loved one is going to be like safe and like protected in some way and like I don't know if people are just uncomfortable we don't want to think about decomposition and like going back to the earth and like as an environmentalist that is like comforting to me but for some people that's not like I don't want I don't want that I don't want to be you know worm food or whatever you know like that's not a comforting thought and so I think there's that aspect of it too maybe sure sure just maybe more education you know yeah all right, well, we just have a few minutes left. Anyone else have any other questions? Well, this has been so great, Stephanie. It's so educational and lots to think about. <laughs> Thank it's you so fun. much for having me. I I love giving this talk and I'll drop my email again in the chat and feel free to reach out to me or any we do have on our website like an info at email that is regularly monitored by our admin so like you will get a it doesn't just like go to the ether so if if you don't find my email like someone will answer that one great well we have these the first uh wednesday of every month so check out our website reusable.org and um, with that i can give everyone a couple of minutes left on their um in their day so thank you so much thank you leslie all right